Welcome to the October Schumann talk, where we discuss issues we, we face in Europe today in the light of Robert Schumann's vision for Europe as a community of peoples deeply rooted in Christian values. For on May the 9th, 1950 at 6 p.m., the French Foreign Minister Robert Schumann gave a three minute speech in which he laid the foundation for the European House where today 500 million Europeans live together in peace. This was the defining moment of post-war Europe for it launched the European movement for peace and unity that has led to today's European Union. Schumann's vision for Europe, as I said, was for a community of peoples deeply rooted in basic Christian values. He wanted to make war unthinkable for future generations. Today, however, war fills our daily headlines again. The war waged by Putin's Russia against Ukraine. The international order created by international cooperation after World War II is being fundamentally challenged by Putin's doctrine of Ruski Mir. Today we're going to address the question of war and peace with two very special guests, Zach Johnson who's joining us from Boston and Mohamed Bokhari joining us from Rotterdam. We're going to talk about the radical idea of loving your enemy. Welcome Zach, welcome Mohamed. It's great to be here Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. And I'm going to just remind our listeners that actually today, October the 9th, is the anniversary of something significant that took place in 1989 in Leipzig, East Germany then. It's called the Miracle of Leipzig. And two years ago, exactly on this date, I interviewed several women who grew up in East Germany and were involved in some way with this miracle of Leipzig, where there had been prayer meetings every Monday night in the Nikolai Church in Leipzig, led by the pastor for peace. And this movement, this prayer meeting began to grow and grow and then fill the whole church. And thousands of people were coming. And the Stasi tried to infiltrate that. And eventually, on October the 9th, the, uh, there were thousands of both Stasi, that is the, um, the East German police or secret police, and many uh, riot troops gathering around the church, as well as thousands of supporters of peace. And um, they spilled out into the streets after the sermon, holding candles and sheltering the candle with their other hand, the, the, the flame on the candle, and moved between all the troops that were there who were waiting for some provocation. Uh, well, they were, they were trying to provoke the, uh, the crowd to some kind of violence that would give them the excuse to lay into them, but it never happened. And it, this peaceful march broke the back of the, uh, the, the authorities, actually broke the, the, uh, the, the authority of the authorities and led directly to the events in Berlin with the opening of the Berlin Wall exactly a month later on November the 9th. It is this soft power of love, truth, and justice, overcoming the hard powers of power and violence that we're gonna be talking about tonight and perhaps even taking it a radical step further. So we, we have in, in both of you two very unusual stories and somehow your paths have converged um, and I'm saying here how do the paths of a Muslim and an Amish converge well actually you've just told me exactly that you're not ex exactly <laughs> Amish you're married to a Mennonite and you're very familiar with the Amish and the Mennonite communities but uh, perhaps we'll start with you Zach and you tell us well you were actually born in Quito, Ecuador, in South America. Um, and tell us briefly about your story and how you got onto a path that you found yourself connecting 
with a Muslim, Muhammad. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I'll I'll try to keep this brief because it is it is hard to to talk about the whole story. But I will share that the previous president of Sattler College, interestingly enough, well, now that you mentioned that, Zach, I haven't I, I needed to introduce you really as the president of uh, Sattler College, which is there in Boston, and that's named after Michael Sattler, uh, an Anabaptist from uh, the 1500s, and um, he uh, and, and there's a reason why you've named this or this college has been named uh, after Michael Sattler. I'm sure that you'll touch on that. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, so I, I wanted to tie into the story you shared because the previous president of Sattler College, his name is Dean Taylor, and he wrote a book called A Change of Allegiance. And in that book, he tells a story. He was stationed in the U.S. Army in Berlin, right as the wall was coming down, and he recounts a story of reaching through a hole in the wall and shaking a man's hand on the other side and saying, brother, or I think he, I'm not going to butcher the language. I think Buddha was the, the phrase. And this moment in his life changed the trajectory from being a, a patriot for the United States to also making this transformation of conscientious objection. So I am through di various degrees tied to the story you shared there, but I was I was born in Quito, Ecuador, so I, I used to be a dual citizen there. Spent 18 years there in a in the capital city of Quito, and then I at 18 my community the the typical path was to go to college in the United States. It was a very uh, United States oriented missionary community, and then so I I went to somewhere called the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, which is one of the military service academies that produces the, the largest percentage of officers that run the various branches of the US military. I went to the Air Force Academy. I then in the middle of that, I spent a year in Mozambique. So I, I love Spanish and Portuguese. My, my expertise and passion tends to be in the Latin American region. And then that was with an organization called Samaritan's Purse. I came back to the United States, finished my training at the Air Force Academy. I did well in school, so they sent me to place called the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. The Harvard Kennedy School produces many international presidents. I don't know how, how familiar you are with that institution. So I had my chance to interact with sort of the, the diplomats and the politicians based here in the, the Cambridge area right outside Boston. In the middle of that journey, I became very disenfranchised with the, the thought of what it meant to be a Christian in the US military. Um, also, the thought of following a two-party political system where I felt compromise on both ends. And I met a man here in Boston who I would say introduced me to this concept of the kingdom of God. And the, the rest is really history. I, I left, I, I decided I was completely cut to the heart on Jesus's teaching, specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, and that I, I found them incompatible with my life. And then the Air Force then stationed me in L.A., LA and California. I, I worked at a base there in the for the US space program. And then shortly after I was released, a week later, I drove here to, to Boston to help start Sattler College. It's the third college approved in the state of Massachusetts in the last 40 years. So we're, we're sort of trailblazing here a little bit and we're, we're named after Michael Sattler. And we like to say that Michael Sattler didn't consider himself an Anabaptist, but that label was given on him by the by the Catholic Church specifically. And my favorite line from Michael Sattler is, the sword is outside of the perfection of Christ. That's from um, some of his writings. And he's very famous for the Schleifheim Confession, which I would say sort of pivots towards a, a much more, I'll, I call it a two kingdom view of the world. Mohammed and I met each other because Mohammed wrote a proposal called the Kingdom Army. And I, I got a hold of his uh, his proposal, and it, it sounded very familiar to my my passions to develop. I, I would call it an army of peacemakers who are following after Christ. And the irony is that Muhammad has, is is uh, knocking on the door, seeking after Christ. And I, I interact with him on a regular basis, discussing these deeply held Christian values that you mentioned there in the beginning, Jeff, on the Schumann Center. And that's where I'll leave it. Uh, coming back to Michael Sattler, um, the Anabaptists were uh, indeed called that by uh, by their opponents, who said they were the rebaptizers, 
as far as right. they were concerned, this was the only legitimate baptism. But we're talking about the early 1500s. We're talking about a movement that started in Zurich. Uh, Sattler was actually north of um, uh, north of Zurich and um, um, in, uh, part of the southern southern Germany there. And um, he represented a much more balanced approach than some of those who have been called Anabaptists, um, mm -hmm. who, although they, uh, most of the Anabaptists were pacifists, some of them took up arms to defend themselves, and there's uh, an infamous situation in Münster that took place in 1535, where um, this movement took over the whole city, and anybody who would not get rebaptized was sent out, uh, they had to. Def they took up arms to defend themselves. They went back to Old Testament ethics and and practiced um, uh, uh, <coughs> polygamy. So, so so many of these things were actually uh, principles that the rest of the Anabaptist movement did not accept. <coughs> um, perhaps it's better to talk about the radical Reform Reformation. It was trying to get to the roots of Christianity, going back to the early church, as you've called it. Um, That's right. So. Uh, describe the Sattler College a little bit more. What what is its goal? Yeah, so we're, we are we are an institution in Boston, and what I would say is we want students to be on a course to be vanguards of the historic Christian faith, and we do that through academic excellence, and then we have a, a and relational discipleship. So our program is very rooted in in a multi-pronged approach to education where we are just as obsessed about character formation than we are as we are the academic component of it. And so our, our real goal, if I try to, my I, this isn't written anywhere, but we want more people like Michael Sattler to leave and to be leaders in the Christian world. Um, when you look at Michael Sattler's life, I, I think if, if you ever read the story of his martyrdom, it's one of the more inspirational stories you'll come across where he gave his defense in Latin. He was fluent in Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> and he was a German. So you, you see a trend over the course of Christianity that we are sort of letting the control of the Bible go. And I would say that we want, eat, we want our students to rediscover the truths of the Bible because they're there. So we, for example, we're the only college in the US that requires all of our students to take Greek and Hebrew we're not a Bible college. It's a very unique position. And I would say we want to awaken them to these primary sources of Christianity to identify some of the pain points. And I'm hoping that the, the institution produces more martyrs uh, as uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of my, uh, my, my, my ideas and that I think they tie to Muhammad's ideas as well. Well, that's a comment that will become clearer as, as we go on. So you offer bachelors and masters. Do you have PhD students as well? So we, we only opened in 2017. So we only have graduated one class of undergraduates. And okay. so, and we are an accredited institution, but the, the game to start a college in the US is a little longer. So we have goals of growing, but we're, we're pretty young in our, in our journey. I think just for our listeners that um, uh, you could find out more about Michael Sattler through a film called The Radicals, That's which right. may be accessible somewhere online. Um, but you certainly uh, is available on on a on a DVD, yeah. That's right. Thank you, Zach. Um, Muhammad, then, um, no guessing what your religious background is, with a name like Muhammad. <laughs> Tell us, how did you get on a track that led you to Zach? Well, um, so I I came to the Netherlands here to uh, to pursue a master's in uh, colonial and global histories at Leiden University, and you came. And from I, I, I come from Pakistan originally, um, from, uh, from a devout Muslim family. And um, I started experimenting, you know, with uh, like going to church and, and, and things like that. But it was, it was, it was very, um, it was just out of curiosity in the beginning. But while I was Muslim studying, I was picking up my... Uh... Muhammad, why would a Muslim want to go to church? Uh, I, I, I had a friend who uh, was, was a roommate at the time, and they told me that they had gone to a church close by. I was living in Leida. It's a city in, the, in South Holland at the time. 
and it was just out of curiosity because I wanted to interact with people and and make friends and 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 things like that. Um, and I and I did that and I experienced it, but it it was it wasn't uh, anything serious until I read uh, Tom Holland's book Dominion. In the um, mm. in the end, the close of my masters, and and that book was incredible. Uh, it, it 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 demonstrates that how um, the Christian faith is um, is responsible in, in in a way for some of the values that we deeply hold today, uh, not just in the West but also in in in, in Pakistan, for instance, and. And I and I said and I felt like I really wanted to uh, to find out where, um, where where these values that I have they come from as well. And this is what Tom Holland was was writing in the book, and that made me more curious to um, to find out more about uh, the Christian faith. So I started attending church more regularly, and what what struck me the most was the uh, the incredible paradox that we find. In the pages of the Bible, I mean, paradox, uh, which is also what Tom Holland says, it's uh, it's the very engine of the Christian faith. So just like Zach, you know, I I read the new um, uh, the the Sermon on the Mount, and that um, is filled with paradox. It's a, a small text, but very powerful and filled with all kinds of paradox. And and I decided that. I would l love to spend the next four years studying one of these paradoxes. And that's how I got into my PhD program. I decided to settle on Matthew 5, 44, which is love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. An incredibly strange idea, an incredibly powerful idea as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and then I got uh, an admission at uh, Fry Universität and my my supervisor, uh, Bernard Reitzma. Uh, and I'm, I'm just at the start, but this is, this is what, I've, what, I've, what I've decided, is to really understand, really look into where the idea comes from, um, in the enemy love, and what its implications are at the individual level, at the political level, the spiritual level, what, what does it look like? And while also trying to um, to understand this idea, I um, I wrote this proposal called the Kingdom Army because I was trying to figure out like how can we use enemy love in an organized way in the modern in the, in the modern setting. And I I wrote this proposal, Kingdom Army, and I um, and I sent it to um, another institution in. Uh, in, in, in the U.S. and they're called Chazak Rescue. Chazak is uh, Hebrew for you know have courage, mm -hmm. um, and they're an international rescue organization. And they forwarded that proposal to 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 Zach, and that's how we connected. And we've been talking ever since, and it's been a pleasure. Okay, so you're studying at the Free University in Amsterdam, the Freie Universiteit, started yes. by Abraham Karper in 1880, um, and uh, that's um, so you're going to tell us more about this proposal later on. Um, yes. But I want to know from you what, yeah, well, you've really touched on it already. What fascinates you about Jesus? You're, you're a Muslim. How do you describe your relationship with Jesus? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's, um, I would say it's, uh, it's very complicated, but also very simple at the same time. Again, the, the paradox. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, complicated in a way because um, from a Muslim perspective, you cannot ever say, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the son of God or that he's mm -hmm. God in the flesh. I mean, there, there, there's a verse in the Quran that talks about the earth quaking and the mountains crumbling, if anyone would, were to say such a blasphemy. So as, as growing up as a Muslim, um, this is sort of drilled into you that you never say these things about God. So um, from a Muslim perspective, Jesus is just another one of those idols that people have been making idols throughout, throughout history. Mm. But encountering Christians and speaking to them and reading the Bible 
and reading a text as moving as the Summa of the Mount. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to feel that there is uh, an immense power, an immense uh, influence in this idea that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he is God come in the flesh to take on our sins, to suffer for us. And for me, the most... Um, the, the most powerful message about this story is 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 skin in the game. It it displays that mm -hmm. God has skin in the game with regards to human suffering. That has to and do with the incarnation, game. God becoming man, yes, putting human skin on him and being yes. right there in the midst of the conflict. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and at, and at the same time, um, I'm I'm also starting to feel that, um. There can be no higher um, metaphysical definition of human dignity than that in the crucifixion. Yeah. So you're a Muslim seeking the truth about Jesus. You're knocking on his door, as it were. Yes, that's how I describe it. I'm, I'm, I'm knocking on the door. I'm trying to understand it intellectually, emotionally. And I'm also praying to God to see, to see where it goes. Okay. Now you talked about your Kingdom Army proposal. We'll come back to that. I want to go back to Zach. And you've made a proposal concerning the four quadrants. Would you unpack that for us, Zach? Yeah, I'll I'll give it my best shot, Jeff. I uh, so one of the things that bothers me most in my journey out of the military, you, you can imagine, you can imagine the word pacifism, and then mapping that on to a somebody who's been been through sort of the military training. When I look at the word pacifism, I really, really, really don't want to be classified as a pacifist in the terms of being passive in the conflict of the world. You, we, we see- pacifism, yeah, it's not passivism, yeah. <laughs> but right. you, were, you were an officer with the Air Force, is that right? What rank were you? But I actually only made it to second lieutenant, so the lowest officer rank, and then I refused promotion because I came into some of these, these teachings. So when, when I look at this, I've been I've been at Sattler for the last four years, and my my obsession really is with peacemaking. When I when I look at the Sermon on the Mount, and I I see Jesus as the the genius peacemaker who's given us these principles, but I I rarely see when I look around me and I try to research, hey, where where is this being put into practice? Not not only where is this being discussed intellectually, where is this being put into practice? I'll I'll just self-admit that I feel like the world is really lacking in what I think Jesus was getting at when he says, blessed are the peacemakers. And even what Muhammad talked about when he said, you shall love your enemy. Um, where, where are they is my question. And my, my general thesis is that there's not a lot of the people around that, that are doing this. Um, Nick, do you know the so, story of St. Martin? Do you uh, know St. Martin of the story is yours? Yeah, St. Martin of Tours is one of the first documented conscientious objectors. Absolutely. He was in the Roman army, became a believer, and said, I'm not going to fight anymore. And they, he said, I'm willing to go on the front line without any weapons. And I don't know if that's part of your inspiration. You know, he came up later. There's an irony for me with St. Martin of Tours that he cut, there's a story where he cut off his cape and clothes a homeless man and the cape in, I think in, is it Latin? Yeah, in Latin is called a capelli, which is where the chapel was originated. And now the chapel at the Air Force Academy has a big cross that's in the form of a sword on it. And so there, there, there's some ironies on how that gets hijacked. So yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> We, and the, yeah, so that we could spend a lot of time talking about it. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I don't know if I'm able to see the 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 images that I wanted to share here. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll start here. If if I could write a book or a mantra based on what I I think the trajectory of the peacemaking world would be, the mantra would be called something. It would be called "No Blood But Our Own," and I I explain this mantra using something called the Four Quadrants of Peace. And my, my thesis is that the world, the Christianity needs to move towards a sacrificial approach to two kingdoms peacemaking. So I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that if we can go to the next slide here. The, um, 
Uh, can we, yeah, one slide back. So I just wanted to share this picture because I think it's relevant to frame my, my story. This picture is taken at my trial to leave the, the Air Force. So this is the, the founder of the church I attend and also the college I attend. He, he, he founded Sattler College as well. His name is Vinny Caravella. And in my trial, our, there's, a, there's a military JAG that asked the question, help me understand your worldview better so I can determine the outcome of whether I was were religious or not. So this man basically laid out a premise that Jesus is a king. Um, each king has a set of laws or a set of ways. In our, in our example, our constitution becomes the Sermon on the Mount. And then the church becomes the people or the nation following that king. It's a very simple framework that was described. And that's sort of one of my, my, my worldviews right now. And I, I think it's relevant to, to sort of frame my own take on this, because I know there's no, there's no, no small amounts of disagreements on that worldview here. But if we go to the next slide here, I, I basically did, I've read a lot of books. I've traveled to different institutions to research peacemaking and peace building. And what I've found most helpful is to sort of categorize the, the thesis on peacemaking in terms of two questions. One is, different people's views of God and the centrality of God and how they interact with the world. The other one is people's view of enemies. So here in the slide, you see God is on the X axis here and your view of enemies is on the Y axis. And this creates sort of a four quadrant system of how to categorize how different people go about interacting with human security, go around acting with justice, mercy, peace building, and what I basically found, if we go to the next slide, and this is my own category, is when you look at the U.S. and Christianity in America, I, I would say that the majority of people have a high view of God or God is at the center of relationships, but a low view of enemies. And so I, I've put these kinds of people as I used to be. There, there's a man named Reinhold Niebuhr. He doesn't exactly categorize it. He, he came up with a word named Christian realism. But I would also put in Christian nationalism to understand this category of people. And the just war theory really is a, a solid basis on how people view it the world. And then I'll, I'll go over to the over to the bottom, uh, the bottom quadrant here. I'm making my way on. There's a view of people who have a low view of God and a low view of enemies. This is a, a classic realist perspective that really, you know, politics and international relations comes down to about physical security. And so there's a lot of people who operate in this quadrant too. There's, there's a man named uh, Stephen Walt, who I, under, I studied under at the Kennedy School, influences a lot of the, the political environment here. And then there's a category of people who God is not necessarily central in, the core, in, in somebody's worldview. He's not very important, but you still have a high view of enemies. Um, I, I would call this view globalism, or sometimes I even call it liberalism, is a, depending on how you would define the term. A secular and, humanist, yeah. Yeah, I think you can understand the, 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 the degree of people. And what I found personally is when I describe my story, leaving the military and rejecting violence, a lot of people will kind of give me a thumbs up. They'll say, hey, that's cool, man. Like, that's great. But as soon as I stop, start talking about the centrality of Christ in relation to that model, that's when they're like, whoa, you're going a little bit too far there. Um, we, don't, we don't mention that word in the, our conversations. So I, I've noticed that there, there tends to be a little bit of, of, of bridge building to be done. And then my thesis is that, you know, where we should, what Jesus is getting at is that we have a high view of God and a high view of enemies, that we won't, we won't use violence with our enemies. God is central. And this is what I call sacrificialism. Um, some, some other authors have called it crucify, crucifix suffering, sort of this idea. Muhammad got a little bit into it, this incarnational Christ who did who was supposed to be a warrior, but instead, instead suffered on the cross for us. So in order to, to sort of better understand these, I'll, I'll try to work my way through these in the next five minutes if we go to the next slide. Realism, yeah, realism, one slide ahead here. There's, I, I've put in sort of these concentric circles on, on who's most important yourself is the most important and you can't be reconciled to your enemies we have 
your neighbor, state, others as important relationships in there. When we move on to an example of this, if we can go to the next slide, this is a man named Pat Tillman. So Pat Tillman was a linebacker in the NFL. I just like to, to think about this. Not a Christian, um, but after 9-11 in 2001, there's a story. He dropped his very high-performing career, joined the U.S. Army. And he's, this is a green beret you see on his head and was killed in action. So we see an example of a realist martyr here in the flesh, somebody who is motivated to, to die for those beliefs. When we, when we think about Christian realism, one slide ahead here, you, you end up getting this category of people who put, who put God in the center, but really on the outside edge, you see in the bottom quarter, you can't, you rarely reconcile yourself to your enemies. Um, enemies are, are on the outside and you, I, I've, even, I've interacted with missionaries in this quadrant who would think that, well, I can convert my enemies, but I can kill them as well. It's kind of an interesting uh, paradox to be facing in this camp. When you, I'll go one more slide forward. An example of this, this isn't a martyr, but this, this man's name is Dave Eubank. He's, he's making a couple of splashes in the US. He, he formed a, a group called the Free Burma Rangers. And so he's an ex uh, army ranger from the US and he formed an international organization who operates in Burma, but this, is, this picture is actually taken in Iraq and they run around just really risking everything. They, they're putting their life on the lines pretty constantly trying to, trying to interact with conflict in pretty tangible ways, but they do carry weapons with them and they will take out some of the some of their opposition of enemies, but you can see sort of this, this drive for martyrdom here and some of their guys have been killed in action there. And when we look at the globalist framework, one slide ahead, I would say that a globalist view, you really, you really are just trying to create unity among humanity and the particular view of God, whether it's, whether it's Christ or Muhammad or Buddha, it's, it's nice, but it doesn't really matter. And th there'll be some sympathies with, with the love of enemy and with, with promoting peace and justice and, and these kinds of things. However, Christ is really a, an interesting, uh, Christ and the church is interesting to try to put into this framework here. And when you think, when I think of like a, someone acting out of a globalism uh, perspective, I'll share a story of a man named uh, Michael Sharp here. Next, next slide here. So Michael Sharp went to an institution called Goshen in Indiana and he, after, after joining Goshen, he joined the UN and was a UN peacekeeper. He, he was in the peacekeeping. So he went, he was deployed to the DRC and he ended up being uh, decapitated. His colleague was shot. However, the name of Christ never got, it never gets mentioned in his testimony. So he's a martyr for a globalist perspective, motivated by this idea of enemy love, but not necessarily the centrality of God. So when we, when we look at sort of the, the sacrificialism viewpoint, next slide here, there, there's, a, there's an irony and you can't see it, but behind the Schumann Talks logo, it says the state is that when we look at the state, we are not attempting to reconcile the state back to God. It is a, uh, it's, it's something that many people have tried to do and the state becomes their primary primary interaction with how to deal with conflict. Instead, we, we view God as the center and then we elevate the importance of our enemies and our neighbors over our own security. And this drives a motivation for sacrifice like people like Mike Sattler, Dirk Willems. And you, I think you, could, Jeff, could probably think of a lot of people acting out of this. However, so next slide. So before, I, you, go I, that, before you go onto that slide, I just yeah. want to go back to the, uh, the circles. Um, right. Those first three that you showed us all had the self either in the center or the first first circle. Now right. you've got self right out in the outer. That's that's the radical difference between that and all the other options. That's exactly right. And I can I can give um I can I give sermons on this. I, I also teach a bit in the classroom. There's a Muhammad and I had a conversation about is there a difference between a lecture and a sermon? Maybe, maybe not. But you see this in you see this in people like Paul and Moses are the two examples I share. 
that both of them in the Bible, there's moments where they, they plead to God and they say, God, if you'll save my brethren, wipe my name out of the book of salvation, both of them. And that's really a, a unique mentality. It's a self, there's a selflessness to that. There's a letting go of rights. It's, there's not a demand that you be treated well. So it, it is unique. And then, so this is a story of Dirk Willems. This is, uh, this is actually a depiction from the Martyr's Mirror, which is uh, a book that depicts a lot of uh, the martyr story. So this, this is man, a scenario it, that takes place here in Holland. That's right. Tell that's us right. about it. So the, the story goes, you probably know more about the history. Dirk Willems was a, was part of the Anabaptist community and he was locked up in a cell um, for his faith and he got to escape. He's running, this man in the river is chasing after him and falls into an ice, a frozen body of water. Dirk Willems could have escaped. He realizes that his captor has fallen, turns around and saves the guy that was chasing him and then ends up being caught. And I, I believe the story ends with his life being, with his life being forfeit. Radical, right? That you would, you would risk your own life for the life of your enemy. Yeah, the figure and, on the right on the bank is his commander, the commander of the man who is pursuing Dirk Willems, and he yells out, arrest that man. He's just saved him, and he has to turn around and arrest him. Yeah. That's, that's right. So when we put all the quadrants together here um, in this next slide here, you, you can notice some, some striking, some striking uh, differences and similarities as well. But I would generally say that the world of peacemaking which I described there, what Jesus is talking about. It's not a popular view right now. It's the top right-hand um, corner, yeah. Yeah, the peacemaking world or the, the sacrificialism. And I would call the mantra to this is no blood but our own there. I, I on, When you go over to the left to the peace building world, so peace building has become the new academic pursuit of peace. I went and I, I got a, a certificate from a, somewhere called the Center for Justice and Peace Building here in the US, it's based in Virginia, which it has intense Mennonite roots. However, I, my, my one, my mini, one of my critiques of their program is I never heard the word Christ mentioned once in any of my, my classes and things like that. However, I, I do wanna say that I, I do think there's very well-intentioned people here. Realists tend to use war as a mechanism for security and peace. And then just war theorists also use just war and, and missions and when you, when you really look at the, the phrases here, so I'll go one more slide because it's a little more clear. So my, my, my thesis is that when we think about conflict and peace, the guiding principle behind what Jesus is getting at is no blood but our own, that we'll, we'll sacrifice ourselves, but we won't do harm to our enemies. Um, the, the peace builder will say as little blood as possible. What really has surprised me is you'll, you'll often find that in... In, in questions like self-defense, like these these sort of hypothetical discussions on what happens if a man breaks into your house and has a gun to your wife's head, many people in this camp will will be sympathetic to self-defense, and the 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 notion of enemy love hasn't saturated your personal life, which is an ironic twist on Christianity. Augustine taught exactly the the opposite, and then this is as much blood as necessary is what the realists would say that um, you know, war is a necessary evil and as much blood as is just is sort of the just war theorist. And when I look at my, my call and what I'm trying to just promote here at, at my institution and beyond and in the church is really to try to shift people into this chop quadrant with every ounce that I have in me. Um, I'm, I'm a huge believer in peacemaking. I, I believe that Jesus had all the answers in the Sermon on the Mount, and and we have deviated from it, and many times in the way that we interact with the world. Zach, can we just go back to the last slide, the quadrant? Yeah. Uh, as much blood as as is just. That's the Christian nationalist, Christian realism. Right. That's where Christianity has become the religion of an em of the empire. That's right. Um, we we've just seen. Queen Elizabeth being buried with much pomp and ceremony, and she had herself a very personal, a real personal faith that so much was the wellspring, can we say, of her own servanthood, and yet her faith was encrusted around um, so much of the 
the pomp and power, uh, the tradition um, and, and ceremony of a Christianity that became the faith of the empire, and which right. really began when, when the Archbishop of Canterbury um, arrived there, Augustine, uh, there was already a Christianity that was very different before this power of faith came. And, 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 and in a sense, this is, for many people in the West, this is the only Christianity we've known. But when, when we hear more about the radical uh, Christianity, and, and we could put Celtic Christianity uh, into that as well, a very different approach. This is really what you're talking about. There is an alternative. And um, we're going to come back to that. Thanks, Zach. Um, right. And I, I, I just wanted to add on, I, I was reading an article about the Queen's obituary, and it was in The Economist. I read The Economist to try to keep up with my European knowledge. And they, they said that the when the Queen was coronated, the moment, uh, this is my source of The Economist, so don't trust it. They, she said that the moment before where she stripped down the regalia and was anointed with oil was really more of the meaningful moment for the Queen and her, and that, that she, she had this thought that she really was being anointed from a heavenly power to govern the monarchy. So it, it's a, it's a meaningful moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, of course, you know, when we read about Samuel's warning about what happens when a people choose a king, he will take your sons for, as soldiers and so forth. So um, this touches on the radicalness of, of uh, what you're proposing here. Now, Mohammed, um, I have uh, never met a Muslim talking like you are, <laughs> and um, who has gotten as far in this radical thinking as to make a proposal for the Kingdom Army. When I read it through, your name was not on the paper. I had to ask, well, who, who wrote this? Uh, <laughs> so tell us, what, what is this proposal all about? Right, so um, it's it's basically um, an attempt to think through, uh, to operationalize the kind of radicalness that, that Zach is talking about. Um, you know, G Jesus Christ says, um, my kingdom is not of this world. Um, and therefore, you know, there aren't any people coming to, to defend me. And if we really look at it, it's... It's incredibly, incredibly uh, powerful, these, these words, because what they're doing is, is they're dividing um, what it means to have power, what, mm -hmm. uh, what it means to, to serve. And, and, and in, the, in the paradoxical nature of the Bible, this got me thinking, well, if Jesus Christ says my kingdom is not of this world, but all kingdoms do have an army, then what would the kingdom army look like? Mm. It Paradoxically, it would not look like any other army that exists at all. Uh, most armies of most kingdoms uh, fight wars. And the kingdom army uh, would fight the anti-war. What is an anti-war? Well, I'll, I'll come to that later. So... The three, the three um, books that really influenced me while, while writing this proposal was, uh, the first book is, um, is, is, is Tom Holland's Dominion that, that, I, that I mentioned already. It, it talks about how um, Christianity or Jesus' teachings is the kind of revolution that everyone seems to have forgotten. It's like um, the air we breathe, right? Or fish swimming in water have no idea that they're swimming in water. Um, so, so, so and, and, and the paradoxical nature of these teachings, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, a kingdom, uh, you know, that is not of this world. Um, um, and, 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 and things like teachings like enemy love, which are, which are incredible. And yeah, another book that, this, Muhammad, that, that for the reader, for the listeners, um, the very first guest we had as a, on a Schumann talk was Tom Holland, and he unpacks his book much further. So if you go to YouTube and, and look up Schumann talks, uh, go right to the beginning, and uh, you can get more understanding of what Muhammad's talking about here about Tom Holland. Go ahead, yes. Mark. 
Um, so the second book that I that I that I was going through was uh, Samuel Moyn. Uh, it's called Humane, and it basically talks about how um, the the idea to uh, humanize warfare has actually resulted in the permanence of warfare. It's 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 a very interesting idea. It mm. it and in in the article in in the book uh, Samuel Moyn, who's out of uh, Yale University, he talks about that. Uh, institutions like the Red Cross and others um, throughout throughout the ages, um, these in, in these institutions, these people have been trying to uh, decrease human suffering during war mm -hmm. by enacting uh, these these organizations. Uh, he also talks about Florence Nightingale, you know, uh, nurses, the Red Cross, how uh, you know treaties and laws about how to treat prisoners prisoners of war and things like that. But it's had the opposite effect. It's had the it's had the effect of keeping war alive longer than it should be, um, and the hero of the book is is, is Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, um, who who um, who is who sees this who sees this coming as well, and he's a critic of it. The author and, of War um, and Peace. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he, um, being a, a critic of this, espouses this radical idea of uh, nonviolence. And also vegetarianism. Um, hmm. So, so, so that um, is another book that, that that that's influenced me. Is is that if we try to humanize a thing that's evil, what if the result is that we end up making it permanent? And we don't want that. We want the total eradication of 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 of, of, an, of an evil idea, of a bad idea. So this is another book that's influenced me, and there's another that that's that's come out as well, um, and it's uh, it's by uh, it, it, the author is um, William McCaskill. He's out of Oxford University, and he's one of the founders of effective altruism. And uh, the, the 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 name of the book is What We Owe the Future, and he talks about um, uh, the philosophy of long termism. Is that we as a species, as a human species, our job is to think in the long term. We're talking about centuries, we're talking about millennia. Um, in, historians would call this the long durée. Um, and basically he says that human beings' goals, our goals, the goals that we decide today should be, um, should have centuries and should have millennia down the line. How are we impacting uh, people you know, a thousand years from now. Basically, a civilizational lens of our actions today. And I uh, and I've understood Dominion, the, the work of Tom Holland, as a Christian reading of long-termism, which is how Christianity has influenced the preceding centuries. And how can Christianity um, and Christian teachings, uh, Jesus's teachings, how can they influence the centuries to come? So these three books are are, are, are interesting to me, um, and um, that's uh, why I, you know, decided to write uh, the, the Kingdom Army proposal. Now, of course, someone someone can ask, well, um, isn't this a contradiction in terms? Why why call it an army? You know, we're talking mm -hmm. about peace here. So why why does the word army, you know, appear in the uh, in, 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 in the proposal. Um, I, I would say that's, that's, that's on purpose. That's exactly important, that we need um, peacemakers, especially Christian peacemakers, to think in these, uh, in these terms. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about uh, anti-war and contra soldier in your paper. Yes, uh, yes. That, so um, uh, another another uh, writer who uh, was was while I was writing this paper, I read him a bit as well. He was called uh, William James, who's perhaps the world's first peace psychologist, and he wrote this pioneer art article. It was called "Moral Equivalence of War," and basically, what he he he's talking about what drives young men, especially young men, to sign up for war. And it's these heroic aspects like honor, courage, you know, 
uh, a chance to display your your manly virtues and and he 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 admired this a lot and we we, we also know that gandhi for instance mahatma gandhi he he was really inspired by this idea of militarism and this idea of military heroism mm-hmm. gandhi famously he he was inspired by militarism but he hated militancy there's there's a difference between the two militancy is the use of force uh, to to acquire your goals but militarism is the discipline the, the the heroism all all the stuff that's attached to warfare now if you ask someone today uh, a young person why they joined the army or, or things like that they're probably n- saying that i want to go out there and kill someone is probably not the first answer you'll get the first answer you'll get mm-hmm. is i want to be part of a club of elite physically mm-hmm. strong and able to to show my my physical prowess and able to do things that other people cannot do and ideas of sacrifice and all that mm-hmm. so william james he writes that the moral equivalent of war is national service which is where you go out there and you build roads you build bridges you work for your country i think he's mistaken i think mm-hmm. he's mistaken i think the moral equivalent of war is the anti war or if war is going to fight a war anti war is going uh to stop a war is this your term i i i haven't come across anyone who said this before but uh so far yeah so far this is something that i thought of myself um and um, and 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 the, the the problem with what william james is saying is that he's he's replacing the battlefield with 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 a peacetime environment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but but i don't think i don't think uh peacemakers should do that at all in fact mm-hmm. in the paper that i wrote it was what i was saying was that imagine if russia for instance wanted to invade ukraine and in order to invade ukraine they sent soldiers outside the ukrainian embassy and attacked the ukrainian embassy we we call that a war we won't call that a war that that's not a war <laughs> now why is it that peacemakers do the same thing why is it that when there's a war peacemakers go outside embassies and chant slogans and hold placards and say you know mm-hmm. why don't they go to where the fighting is because i i i truly believe that if if you want to be an anti warrior or a contra soldier which is the mirror image of a soldier you need to go there to where the fighting actually is and that 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 basically is 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 what it, is what an anti warrior and anti soldier is mhm well that brings us to your early church example of a contra soldier can you tell us about him Yeah so um I I quoted a few examples in 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 this paper that I wrote but one of the things that really struck out for me was the example of Saint Telemachus um in in the early in the early church um he was in the far east and he was basically a monk living in a cave and he heard the the voice of god telling him to go to Rome and he in, in the middle east somewhere mm-hmm. yes and then he go he goes to uh, to Rome and he sees the colosseum and all these people are going in so he falls them all in and lo and behold there's a gladiator fight that's about to begin and these gladiators they walk uh in front of where the emperor is sitting at the time and as as part of their custom they raise their swords and say we who are about to die salute you mm-hmm. and he is incredibly shocked by this so what he does is he jumps onto the arena and he starts making his way towards the gladiators and the crowd just starts cheering because they think this is all part of the act but when they when he reaches towards them and he starts screaming at them and shouting at them in the name of Christ stop in 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 the name of Christ stop and he comes in the way of of these two gladiators and he tries to 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 split them apart like they stop stop the fighting and when the crowd realizes that what's going on this is this is not uh, he's trying to stop our entertainment they start jeering and booing uh, until um one of the gladiators you know uh, kills him and while he's while he's dying uh, his last words were also in the name of Christ stop hmm. and this uh, according to legend has a powerful effect on uh, on the audience and the emperor 
And according to legend, this was the last or one of the last gladiator fights at, at the time. And this is when gladiator combat, you know, they, they ceased to to cease to be. My point is, this is exactly, this is exactly how Christians need to behave today hmm. in order to confront war. They need to get in the way of warring sides and they need to say in the name of Christ, stop. We, we hmm. need to have priests, bishops, cardinals, uh, pastors, uh, all manner of Christian out there interpositioning themselves between the warring sides without taking any sides and saying in the name of Christ's song. I can't think of a, a, of, a, of a more important thing to say right now. Yeah. What about Muslims and mullahs? Is it because well, um, they, it's really that you've got the inspiration comes from Jesus' teaching? That's why you, you don't think that's realistic? I think uh, Islam has its own um, pacific um, tradition as well. Uh, for instance, uh, yeah, there is there is some nonviolence as well, and and the Islamic uh, take on war is it's 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 deeply influenced by um, just war theories as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, and 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 there are, there are hadiths which are sayings of the Prophet, and also verses in the Quran that talk about how you should never harm someone who is unarmed, someone who's not here to hurt you, uh, the elderly, the women, the children. You need to take care of the, the trees and the crops of, uh, of, uh, of the enemy. There, there, is, there is a very healthy sense of respect and restraint in, in the Muslim tradition. Like, for example, it's interesting, like the... The verses that allow Muslims to fight are also followed by verses of restraint that don't go too far because God does not love people who go too far. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, idea can really um, uh, ring with Muslims as well. That, that, now, that's my personal belief. Thank you. Coming back to your paper, you talked earlier about skin in the game and you say mm -hmm. skin in the game is the modus operandi of the kingdom army. Can you unpack that? Right, so um, skin in the game is basically um, 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 from a, a concept developed by um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. So he's, a, he's an options trader and a risk analyst. And he, he basically talks about um, how, uh, for instance, like, here's an example. Like um, if somebody built a house, Right, and told you to go live into that house. Um, but if he did not demonstrate by himself that it was safe, you cannot really trust that person. And in, in fact, he talks about the, the Hammurabi uh, code as well, that they had this uh, code that if someone builds a house and the house caves in, uh, then the architect is the one who's held responsible. So you are responsible for the systems and the structures that you build. You're responsible for them. God built a world of suffering. There's intense suffering in this world. He's, he's the architect of, of, of this world. His demonstration of having skin in the game, showing us how do we live in this world of suffering? How does a human being get by with all this suffering? Is, is the life... Of, of Jesus Christ. It's the Sermon on the Mount. That is the skin in the game. And the problem these days that we have with, um, you know, peacemakers is oftentimes there, it's a billion dollar industry and there's hardly, uh, there's, there, I would say there's not much skin in the game where people just go there and they try to um, do, do, do good but they're not able to have that effect. Also, they sort of have this distance between the people that they're helping and themselves. They stay in, you know, uh, in hotels and, and things like that. So that is not having skin in the game. Um, the, 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 the skin in the game for the kingdom army is everything. It is, it is following a God who is willing to uh, do that for us out of love. 
And if God can do that, it's if God can do that for us, we can easily do it for our fellow human beings and to replicate his uh, to replicate his journey. Now, what you have both been sharing would raise lots of questions, and I'm sure many listeners would love to interact with you. Um, both of you, uh, well, Zach, you are already teaching courses, uh, touching on this, and Mohammed, in your um, in your proposal, you propose a one-year master's level academic course, um, and I'm sure a question that many will be asking as they hear you to say, well, how would this work in Ukraine right now? Um, are you prepared to jump into that question? <laughs> sure, that. sure thing. Yeah. So uh, I, I'll throw the caveat out that I, I'm not an expert on the, the war in Ukraine, but I still can have opinions, right? So the, I, I taught a path, I, I take a, teach a class called peacemaking and two of the people who took the class actually decided to stop their studies at Sattler and they're in the Ukraine right now on the, the traditional gap year in, in the US, at least the US college system. And one of the, just, I just have some high level comments. When, when I teach peacemaking, I touch on a book called When Helping Hurts. So When Helping Hurts is a book that largely concentrates on poverty alleviation and the, one of the main points of the book is that the West has gotten really, really, really uh, obsessed with relief, but what is really needed is development. And Muhammad actually touched on that too with the, the comment about people t staying in hotels and, and doing relief. When I, when I think about Ukraine, some of the guiding principles that I've, I've given these two young, young men over there, they're on a, they, they run a mobile clinic and sort of are in involved in the in the aftermath of the conflict not necessarily in the conflict itself is that first our, our aim isn't isn't to reconcile the state back to god if we're talking about christian values that if we have a hope that ultimately the governments will be reconciled and become christian it's it, i think it's a false premise when we look at the bibles two is that Oftentimes in the midst of conflict, we, we forget that the, ult, I'll just, I'll, this is more of a Christian perspective, the ultimate value, thing, ultimate value in humanity is a human soul and the destination of a human soul. So the, the dream in a situation with Ukraine in light of peacemakers, in my humble opinion, is the idea of a church existing somewhere in the crisis in the future where somebody who was fighting against two two people who were fighting against each other are now in brothers in in christ that is what i would say is like the ultimate goal of peacemaking is to reconcile someone back to god and so that that's that's sort of my my brief level comment and i will share just because it's on the top of my mind i was just visiting a man down in nicaragua different different context but i i'll share the story because i think it's relevant this man, his name is Pablo Yoder, and he went to go plant a church in civil in the in Nicaragua during the Civil War in the 80s. Some of you might be familiar with that. So there are sort of remnants of the communist question in a different context. And right now their church is alive and healthy. And within the within the brotherhood there, there are men who were on opposite sides of the war who now sit together and participate in Christ's communion. So when I look at the situation with Ukraine, I would posit rather than have the picture of success being sort of a peace between nations, which I think can be an outcome. It's rather a peace between humanity and men. That, that, those are my, my high level comments on it. Okay, and Mohammed? Um, I, I would say um, very briefly as well that I'm not an expert on um, on the war in Ukraine. But I would say that um, going, coming back to the, to the, to, to the ethic of, um, of, of, of what, what Jesus Christ has taught, we, and I would say um, the concept of interposition, which is also what I, what I talk about in, in the paper, it's getting in the way of the, the warring sides. Um, I would say that um, because this is, in, in, in many ways, this is, a, 
this can be seen as a as a, a, a Christian war in a sense that there's two sides that are the fairly uh, Christian populations and they're, they're they're fighting each other. So I well, would say that using um, so Christian arguments as Putin himself does and uh, uh, patriarch and Kirill, yeah. Yes, yes, and, who, he, and who, he's recently come out. He's just prom promised those who who get recruited, if they die fighting for Russia, they will have their sins absolved. Yeah, so uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, that 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 sounds. Uh, uh, I was just speaking to my brother today about this as well. It sounds eerily uh, jihadist uh, to say that uh, you know your sins will be forgiven um, on, wow. on the battlefield. But this is uh, obviously this is a replacement of who Jesus is and what he's done. If, if you don't believe in Jesus absolving all your sins, then you will, you will have another event that will offer to do that. And it's going to be not the same as what Jesus did. So my, my uh, response would be um, uh, a civil-based defense based on uh, Christian principles, on, uh, on, on, on spirituality, and also um, interpositioning. Get the, the, the priests, um, get the... The bishops and all of them to the front lines and not uh, not away from the front lines where the fighting is. Um, they should be radically ministering to both the Russian and the uh, Russian invaders and the uh, Ukrainian uh, defenders. In fact, there's there's two images here um, of civilians trying to do that at the start of the war. They were bravely jumping in front of the tanks and convoys right. to try to stop them. Um, this is this is this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful example of what uh, uh, you know the church can do uh, in, in in large numbers in large enough numbers to provide an example not just for our own time but for um, you know the the future generations. There's also another uh, picture about um, a woman at the start of the war. There's this woman who comes to a Russian soldier. And she offers him, uh, you know, sunflower seeds, and he asks, "What's that for?" And he and, and she replies, and she says, "Well, when you die, um, you know, they, 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 they'll bloom into 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 new flowers." And I was asking a friend of mine, um, "What do you think about this? What would you do if you were in this situation?" And she said, "I would go bake him a cake." Mm -hmm. Radically different, like. It's 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 this kind of um, Christian love, um, coupled with the idea of of resisting unarmed without without arms, that can have uh, an effect for future generations. If we're talking about the long term, yeah. Okay, well, Zach Muhammad, you have placed some. A lot of radical ideas for us on the table. You've stirred our imaginations. Um, we're going to be, um, it's going to be hard to just forget what you've been talking about. In fact, I hope that this will be um, a tool perhaps for groups to to, to listen to and, and discuss. Uh, if people wanted to know where they could find out more about what each of you are writing about, um, where could they go? Can you give us some um, some 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 uh, websites or resource uh, locations? Zach first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you follow my work at Sattler, can be found at sattler.edu, s-a-t-t-l-e-r.edu, and then it's an incomplete website, but I'm putting together a website called no blood, but our own dot org dot O R G. So that's where okay, you can find cool. what, what I'll be talking about. We'll put those up on the screen. Thank you. And Mohammed. Right. Oh, I don't have a website yet. <laughs> okay, it's still okay. under construction. If people wanted to but, read your uh, proposal. Is that, uh, is that available for people? Yes, that that's available. That's up at uh, no blood, but our own uh, for, for a while. It's, 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 it's also on the no, no blood, but our own. Okay. Uh, any last uh, comments you'd like to make? I, I, uh, I've i never met Muhammad in person, but Muhammad, I'm I'm constantly inspired by you. Um, I, I somewhat joke with people that you remind me more of Christ than most professing Christians and uh, <laughs> that surround me. And I just, I'd really encourage you to 
to keep chasing and knocking on the door because I I'm I'm convinced that you'll find uh, find life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zach. And uh, your work yeah. is deeply inspiring as well. I'm glad to, yeah. to, to have this conversation. And, yeah. and you too, Jeff. Thank you so much for hosting us. Well, I would say, Mohammed, you're, 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 you're deeply on the way as you knock on that door. <laughs> you, you've understood a lot more than most Christians. And yeah, right. uh, thank you for sharing that with us tonight. Thank you, Zach, as well. This has been a really, a really a, a most... Um, stimulating and may i say troubling uh, discussion thank you so much yeah thank you for having us jeff bye bye